All right. Well, uh, welcome everybody uh, this afternoon to this April Cloud panel at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion here in Cincinnati, HUC's flagship campus. Uh, my name is Chris Beecher, and I'm a third year PhD student here in the Pine School of Graduate Studies. I'm also the director of campus ministries for the American Baptist Churches of Ohio. And before we begin, I just want to say a few things. First of all, I'd like to express uh, gratitude to the Cloud Library for hosting this panel, and in particular, Abigail Bacon, who's the head of public services and outreach, for working with me to help get this arranged. I want to thank the staff of the Cloud Library and uh, the IT team for getting all this set up for us, so we really appreciate that. Uh, furthermore, I'd like to express thanks to the American Baptist Churches of Ohio and the Campus Ministry Board for sponsoring this panel and the speakers. And before introducing the topic and the speakers, I want to mention a few upcoming um, items. First of all, we have a Pine School Student Conference on May 13th. The name of this conference is Redacted, Reused, Recycled, Ancient <laughs> Texts Across Time and Space. So the students of the Pine School of Graduate Studies invite you to a student-led conference presenting some of the research conducted over the course of their tenure at the Pine School. This event will feature a number of student presentations, a catered luncheon and keynote address by University of Cincinnati's Dr. Matthew Krause. And of course, later this evening, we're, we're beginning a conversation here today uh, in Pauline studies and its relation to um, early Judaism and early Christianity. But we're going to continue this talk later this evening at 7 p.m. at Kenwood Baptist Church as part of Kenwood's Discipleship Dialogues. The conversation will focus on the Jewish Paul and his Christian mis mission, misconceptions, and future hopes. And all of our uh, panelists will be there this evening as well. And so, whereas this afternoon's panel will focus more on the academic and historical elements in Pauline studies, uh, the conversation this evening will probably be more focused on personal and pastoral concerns. And you, of course, are all welcome to join us for that. We'd love to have you. The topic under discussion this afternoon is restoring Israel, the Jewish Paul and his Gentile mission. And the aim of the panel, if best expressed, could potentially be to stimulate dialogue around the first century figure of Paul in his Jewish and Greco-Roman context. And so to consider how doing so challenges modern readers to rethink Paul and his mission and what this entails for Jewish and Christian scholarship going forward. And so before we begin, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker will be uh, Dr. Joshua Garraway. Rabbi Joshua Garraway is the Sol and Arlene Bronstein Professor of Judeo-Christian Studies at the Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion in Los Angeles. Uh, he was raised in Rochester, New York. Rabbi Garraway earned rabbinical ordination from HUC JIR uh, in 2003 and a PhD from Yale University in 2008. While his academic books and articles focus on the origins of Christianity and specifically the life and writings of Paul, his teaching and popular writing deal with Jewish texts and history more broadly. Rabbi Garraway lives in Pasadena, California with his wife, Professor Christine H uh, Hendrickson Garraway, uh, and their three and their three Twin age, twin age boys. Uh, for fun, he enjoys chess, tennis, opera, period pieces, and taking his kids to Dodgers games and an occasional ping pong match with other scholars. <laughs> uh, next to him, uh, we have uh, on the on my far uh, left, we have Dr. Jason Staples, a PhD, uh, UNC Chapel Hill. He's an assistant teaching professor in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at North Carolina State University. He's the author of Paul and the Resurrection of Israel, Jews, Former Gentiles, Israelites, and the Idea of Israel and Second Temple Judaism, A New Theory of People, Exile, and Israelite Identity, uh, which was published in 2021, and a variety of other articles and writings. Given the wages of an adjunct professor, Jason also needs to work other jobs to feed his family, so he has worked in sports media for over 15 years, does freelance editing, and works as a voiceover artist and audiobook narrator. And then to my immediate left is Dr. David Palmer. Dr. David Palmer is an adjunct professor of New Testament at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary in Hamilton, Massachusetts. Additionally, David has served as the senior pastor for Kenwood Baptist Church in Cincinnati for well over a decade. He holds a PhD in New Testament backgrounds from Hebrew Union College, and his doctoral dissertation focused on the role of scripture in shaping a pious life and was entitled Judaic Padea, the Philosophical Argument and Use of Scripture in Fort Maccabees. He has involved with leading teams of pastors and seminary students with training leaders international to Athens, Greece, offering theological training to ethnic leaders. He and his wife, 
Dr. Christine Palmer, also a graduate of HUCJIR, regularly lead archaeological study tours in Israel, Turkey, and Greece. Um, as we begin this, uh, Dr. Garraway will speak first, and then Dr. Staples, and then Dr. Palmer. And uh, af afterwards, we'll be taking some questions from the audience and from our Zoom viewers. Uh, Abigail will uh, sift through those questions and, and present them as we as we draw towards the end. But uh, I want to give our uh, panelists a hand. Welcome them today, please. Again, thank you all for attending. And I guess we'll go ahead and kick it off with you, Dr. Garraway. Sure. So can people hear me? Do I bring the mic over? Well, this, this should be fine. Yeah, it's fine. You're fine. Okay. People can hear me. OK, so um, I'm going to start differently than I thought um, because of where I'm sitting. <laughs> Between the two thieves. I, I met <laughs> I met my wife right here. This used to be a series of tables and the computer station. There was one computer was right there. And I was there and she was studying at the tables here. And that was more than I don't know, 23 years ago or whatever. Um, so it's kind of odd to be here. So I, I want to make one comment about um, her. She was not Jewish when she started as a student here. She's now a Jewish person. I'm not going to go into that story. I was recently, now several years ago, talking to a friend of mine from college. And in college, I, you know, as many New York Jewish kids do, I found the other Jewish kids and we kind of became a little click. And we're still friends today. And um, a, a few years ago, one of them said to me, you know, isn't it weird that you're like the one that takes Judaism seriously in our group? Um, you know, we're all kind of lax uh, Jews, but we married Jews and you didn't. <laughs> and I said, really? Because like Christy was a Jewish person when we got married. And he said, oh, yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, I, I took issue with it. We're still best friends. But nonetheless, some of you who are not Jewish, you might be like, no, I don't know what that means. But anybody who's Jewish knows exactly what that means. And what it means is, yeah, she's Jewish, but you know, she's not Jewish because she's a convert. That's a 2000 year old problem. I can't go into great detail, but let me give you one other non-Pauline example <laughs> that might um, put it in perspective. Around the year 40 BCE, very famous king, Christians know King Herod was fighting for the crown of Judea against the last of the Maccabean kings. And Josephus writes about this battle, and Josephus says that the last of the Hasmonean kings said to the people, you can't choose Herod to be your king, because in Greek it says he is a hemi-eudios. Hemi, hemisphere, means half. He's a half-Jew. Now, when most people read that, they think what it means is what we mean when we say half-Jew. He had one Jewish parent and one non-Jewish parent, when in fact, it's far more likely that what Josephus means is He's a half Jew because his father is a half Jew. Well, why was his father a half Jew? Because his father was a half Jew. Why was his grandfather a half Jew? Because he had been an Idumean, someone that lived south of Jerusalem, and had, for some reason in the time of King John Hyrcanus, converted to Judaism. And so in a Jewish mind, in Josephus' mind, in a Maccabean mind, he's a Jew, but not a Jew. And there's no word for... A Jew, so he used hemi eudios. My friend used, well, you know what I mean. So what I've been fascinated with in Jewish history broadly is the language that we use to describe transition in and out of the Jewish community. And it's an incredibly complex phenomenon. And that's the, um, the background that I have used to try to understand what Paul is doing and to try to make sense of some of the very difficult, seemingly contradictory language in Paul. Because my belief is that Paul believes that in the wake of the resurrection of Christ, everything about Jewish identity has changed. It is no longer about descent from Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. It is no longer about observance of the Torah. It is no longer about circumcision or the performance of Jewish law. It is simply about baptism into the resurrection and the brand new identity that that gives you. And in my opinion, Paul thinks that that new identity is Jewish. It's Israel. It's child of Abraham. It's every one of all of the monikers 
that are used to describe Jewish people. But what do you do if you tell a Gentile who's just been baptized? Yeah, now you're a Jew. Now you're Israel. Now you're a son of Abraham. And they say, really? Because there's a synagogue down the street and they're Israel and they're Jews, right? To be one of them, don't you have to do X, Y, and Z or be X, Y, and Z? And I think what Paul is doing in his letters is saying, yeah, you're a Jew. Like, I know Jew means that. I know Israel means that, but you're actually Jew and you're actually Israel. And I have no other way of describing it except in the terms of that one. So sometimes it kind of sounds like I'm talking about that one, but I'm really talking about this one. Um, and it produces contradiction where people, if you're a philologist and you say, well, you know, I figured out that Israel means this here. So therefore, Paul must mean the same thing everywhere else that word appears. But that's, in fact, not how language works. We all the time use words in different ways, and it creates ambiguity that then we have to clarify. What we don't have, I think, is Chloe or whoever was presenting Paul's letters saying, oh, you know, a hardness of, this is a, a, a you guys know this, from 1125 in Romans, right? A hardness is, has come upon a part of Israel, obviously, by which I mean the Jews, in order that all Israel, obviously here I mean saved people, which is baptized people, which is really Israel, and Chloe was probably there explaining what that means, uh, and and it, but it's not there in the simple text, and so I mean, I don't want to go through all of the passages that I think uh, make better sense this way, but I would just tell you that I think, for example, in Romans 2, Paul says what he really thinks a Jew is, even though he knows that Jew means the person at the synagogue. And in Romans 9 through 11, he tells you what he really thinks Israel is, but putting it in terms of what you probably think Israel is. And in Romans 4, he explains what a child of Abraham is, even though he knows what you really think a child of Abraham is. And in Philippians 3, he says what the circumcision or to be circumcised really means, even though he knows what you think circumcision means. And that is how I approach all of these controversial passages in Paul's letters. And um, before I finish, I just want to explain why I think that has relevance beyond just giving better readings of Pauline passages, uh, which is nothing to, to sneeze at in its own right, but uh, I like to think in sort of broader historical terms. So what I argued in my early work on Paul is that what we see in a modern kind of theory called post-colonial theory is that when, for example, a colonial country, let's say, I hope this doesn't offend anyone, England, Right, goes into, let's say, India. Right, What happens is that there are people who are kind of stuck, the colonialized subjects stuck between trying to be English and being English, but at the same time being stuck in being Indian, but not wanting to be Indian anymore. And by the way, it works in reverse too. Englishmen that go to India who become Indianized, but somehow remain English. And according to a lot of post-colonial theorists, to make a very long story short, what happens is that over time, it becomes untenable to try to negotiate two mutually distinct identities. And a very famous post-colonial scholar called Homi Baba describes this as what he calls the third space of enunciation, right? You're stuck. I'm not English, but I'm not Indian. What am I? And you have to then articulate what you are in terms of those other things. So what I tried to argue is that Paul's describing all of these new acolytes saying, yeah, you're Jews, you're Israel. You're not Jews, you're not Israel. And that it makes sense that the people who heard this and processed this over time came to ask the question, what are we? Are we Israel or not Israel? Are we Jews or are we not Jews? And what emerged from that, and I don't think coincidentally emerged in the generation after Paul, is precisely the word Christian. A new thing that says, well, yeah, I know I'm, I'm Christian. I'm a, I'm a different thing. It's, it's Israel, it's like Israel, it's not the old Israel, it's a third new thing. And that's what began the centuries long prog pro uh, project of describing what it means to be this third thing Christian over and against Gentile, which we kind of once were but aren't anymore, and Jew, which we kind of are now but aren't really. <laughs> we're something that's a third thing 
as gets described, I think, for the first time by Tertullian at the end of the second century, a third race, a third group, a third people, Christians. That's how I read Paul, how I read the terminology of Paul. And I shall now pass to, <laughs> to Jason. So that's going to be a tough one to to uh, to follow, but I'm going to. You didn't meet your wife here? No, <laughs> I, I did not. Uh, actually, I got. I, I do want to have to know who approached whom. It's it's a long story. <laughs> uh, I was well. I was 23. I don't know. And there are people here who know. This isn't swearing. How much of a jackass I was at that age. I was young and very adolescent and stupid. And so I was still in the age where boys try to impress women by being mean and weird and angry and cruel, and it's hard to explain. And it kind of worked. <laughs> she was like, I, I want to figure out what the hell's wrong with this guy. So then she made some uh, cookies and left them for me. Huh. And I found out through from Bill Limbacher, who I don't think is here anymore, but who well, he will always be our matchmaker because he's like, you know, I saw Christy in the kitchen baking cookies and then I saw you eating cookies. What's happening? She made the cookies. How about that? Yeah. So has she figured out what's wrong yet? Or... <laughs> my, my, my wife would say almost exactly the same thing. I survived rabbinical school and it, uh, it uh, like Enkidu, it tempered me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> so that would make rabbinical school, never mind. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> okay, so tough act to follow, um, but I'm going to do um, my best to uh, to to do so, and and also to I'll, I'll be a little on the shorter side, I think, um, to make sure that we we uh, can facilitate some discussion as well. Um, but actually, I think among active biblical scholars today, I'm probably the closest to your view of anybody else, uh, at least those who are socially accepted. <laughs> That's probably right. Yeah. Oh, there's yeah. a lot of like yeah. far right Christians yeah. that come to group with their scholarship building their phone. Yeah, yeah. But but in terms of of you know active biblical scholars, I would say, you know, as I was going through through uh, the research process, obviously I published after you did. I'd say yours was probably the closest to where I came where I came down. Um, and uh, so I, what what I want to do actually to start is to put a little bit of uh, of history on this from the sort of uh, New Testament studies side of things. And that is, some of you already are, will know this, some of you may be less familiar. So I'm gonna lay down a couple of things about uh, sort of how Paul has been understood uh, through a few different generations. And then uh, I'll, I'll talk about how I kind of came to my distinctive uh, view on this. So first of all, the sort of traditional perspective, the, what, what is often called the old perspective on Paul, is really a Protestant perspective. It's something that, that grew out of Luther's critique and criticism of, uh, of the Roman Catholic Church in, uh, in his day. And Luther, of course, didn't actually want to leave the Catholic Church. He wanted to reform it. He wanted the Roman Catholic Church to, uh, to heed his correction and make doctrinal changes and then, you know, and, and so on. But that didn't happen. Uh, as often happens with religious reformers, uh, other another group actually develops out of their attempts to uh, do something with the tradition that they uh, that they're actually inheriting. Something to this, right? Um, but that old perspective basically boiled down to uh, reading Paul and the Pauline epistles as though he was arguing against what Luther and others would call legalism. And this is the stereotypical, some of you are very familiar with this, essentially the stereotype of Jews as legalistic, trying to earn salvation by works and by doing the law, and everything is about trying to earn God's faith. Uh, and for Luther, what, the, what, what Jews basically are, the people that, that Paul is arguing against, specifically Paul's Jewish interlocutors, for Luther, he reads them as essentially proto-Catholics. There are people for whom, you know, he's he's protesting this phenomenon called indulgences, right? Indulgences are where, you know, if you sin, you do something that you're not supposed to do, something wrong before God, you pay a little bit of money to the church. This developed out of the notion of penance, which developed actually out of the Jewish notion of restitution, right? That do that saying you're sorry isn't enough. And I actually think that's a good a good a good concept right saying you're sorry doesn't really doesn't really finish things you should make it right and if you stole from somebody you should 
give it back and actually maybe a little bit more on top, right? Well, what happens if you lusted after another man's wife? What happens if you commit a sin that isn't easily dealt with that way? Well, one thing you can do is, you know, a little bit of payola for the, uh, for the church will stand in the way as the penance, the, the, the proper way of demonstrating your repentance. And then very quickly, uh, this transitioned into indulgences where at a certain point, you could actually buy indulgences in advance. <laughs> I'm planning on committing adultery. Of course, this is now going to be on the internet that I'm planning on committing adultery, but hey, whatever. Um, I'm planning on committing adultery. What is, what's that going to cost me, <laughs> right? And so then you buy in advance this, this indulgence so that you can live how you want, but then you pay. And then the best part is you can do this posthumously. I'm going to live like a total rotter right up until I die. And then after I die, I'm going to bequeath this amount of my wealth to the church and that's going to get me out of the, you know, post-mortem punishment in the, in the world to come, as it were, right? Uh, so Luther thinks that this is an absolute abomination and, and, and violates the whole basis of, the, of the, the Christian gospel, as he sees it, which he thinks should result in, you know, people living better lives, not, you know, basically being able to pay for living bad lives. And he then interprets Paul's arguments as arguing against that that kind of notion. And then what that then does is sort of, as he reads that back into the text, Paul's opponents must be trying to use the Torah this way. The whole objective is I'm going to offer sacrifices. I'm going to, you know, keep the food laws and so on. And in so doing, that's going to be what's going to make me righteous before God, as opposed to these other things, which really righteousness comes from Jesus, justice comes from Jesus. So he sees that and reads it that way. And this became a very common Protestant reading for centuries. It's the reading that is so still so widely presumed among Protestants and especially evangelicals that any suggestion to the contrary that Paul's not actually talking about that is often received as tantamount to heresy, right? So the thing is, that's actually a really poor reading of Paul's, Paul's letters. Ah. Paul's not arguing against Jewish legalism, which doesn't actually, we don't actually see anything of the sort. And there's nothing like indulgences in early Judaism, right? Well, okay, I see your eyes go wide, but as a as a default, mm -hmm. right? There, there's painting with a broad brush. Um, <laughs> but ultimately in the 70s, you had some people, Ed Sanders and some others, who came in and basically said, look, when we read the early Jewish sources closely, we do not see Luther's proto-Catholics who are running around worried about earning God's favor through doing works of the Torah and, you know, essentially proto-indulgences, anything like that. We don't see this. Instead, we see something else. Paul, Paul's arguments against, you know, whatever was traditional before must be about something else because they can't be about that. And Sanders was absolutely right about this. Now, it's taken a long time for that to sort of become the default. I mean, there's the old uh, saying that scholarship moves forward one death at a time. Uh, and it's, you know, taken, uh, you know, progress uh, happens slowly, but it's now generally default within the field that the older perspective is normally not the, not the default. And some way of grappling with what Sanders deal, uh, puts forward, which others had put forward, I mean, George Foote Moore had already basically said some of these things half a century before Sanders. Sanders just delivered it in a way that made it, you know, unassailable for New Testament scholars. They had to grapple with it the way they hadn't before. But that led then to a number of ideas of where, what is Paul arguing against? If his problem with Judaism is a legalism, then why does he do what he does? Like, why does he stop being a Jew in the way that he had been before? Which of course presumes that he had stopped being a Jew in the way that he had been before, but we'll, we'll address that in a moment. So one then thing that builds off of Sanders was the new perspective on Paul. Some of you've heard about this. And that basically proposed that what Paul's really concerned about is Essentially, the move that, uh, to some degree, your your friend made, which is like, well, like, you know what I mean, <laughs> and that is that there is a privilege in Jewishness that essentially derives from the privileges of birth or inheritance of the Torah and so on, and essentially what Paul's arguing against is some version of what the new perspective folks tend to call Jewish ethnocentrism or you know, pride of place in God's purpose, 
I think a, an easier way to put it would be racism. Uh, it, it, it basically, the idea is Paul's not worried about legalism. He's worried about Jewish racism. Jewish Jews are just, just basically proto-racists. Well, what you've done is you've traded a, a perspective that's perfectly at home in the theological debates of the 16th century for one that's much more at home in the late 20th century, right? And in each case, by the way, the Jews have the, the distinction of being the regressive foil for progressive Christianity uh, that, that is moving the world forward. And, you know, if only those Jews had listened, right? So uh, this is this is a new perspective, although I, I think uh, has obviously its own its own issues there. In the wake of that, there's been another movement that's developed really within the last 10 years, I would say. There's been sort of traction in that, and that's the Paul within Judaism movement, which has argued against this whole idea that Paul stands up opposed to Judaism in the first place. So you look at Sanders, his book is Paul and Palestinian Judaism, which presumes that it's Paul on one side and then Palestinian Judaism on the other, and that, they're, that one is a foil for the other. And the Paul within Judaism perspective has generally argued that, well, we don't really have evidence. Like Paul continues to refer to himself in the present tense as a Pharisee. He doesn't say I was a Pharisee. Right? And that's true in Acts as well, by the way. Acts continues to portray Paul as a law observant, at least in his own mind, Jew. He continues to, you know, he 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 shaves his head when he when after he becomes impure when he's under a vow. He fulfills his vow by going into the temple. That's actually when he gets arrested. There's a variety of these things that shows that he doesn't seem to have, uh, you know, left a lot of this this stuff behind. And so then now you have a little bit of an effort to say, you know, maybe Paul's not actually arguing against legalism or Jewish racism, in which we don't see the same these things represented that uh, in that way. Maybe that's not what he's arguing against at all. Maybe it's something else. And there's been a variety of different, you know, things that are being tried on in that new new ten year you know project that's that's underway. This new new trajectory. Uh, one one thing that I found unpersuasive is a, a more recent suggestion, and, and, and you've had several others who've argued that essentially what makes Paul distinctive is he just recognizes that he has a mission to Gentiles. And it's all about incorporating Gentiles in the larger plan of God, but not really within the people of God, as in like Jews or Israel. They're not like, they're not Israelites, but they're, they're, they're sort of in that End time, you know, end time hangers on. Yeah, they're like the end time hangers on. They're they're righteous Gentiles. They're they're the righteous from the nations who are brought in as a part of you know following Israel's Messiah and all of this. But as far as Israel goes, really not much has changed except that like Jesus is the their Messiah, but like whether they actually recognize that or not, it's not really necessarily germane to Paul's gospel or not. What really matters for Paul is that Gentiles submit. To Israel's Messiah, and that that's what he's really all about. And otherwise, you know, he's just not arguing against anything, you know, Jewish, as it were. And, you know, I, I would say both of us sort of fall sort of in the Paul within Judaism tangentially, like sort of within that, you know, sort of framework in a lot of ways, but different from that trajectory. Because I, one of the things that I've found is that I find that unpersuasive, partly because when you read Paul's letters, he says he received 39 lashes minus one five different times, which means he's come under synagogue discipline five different times. That's not a beating that you're getting from, you know, Roman authorities. He got that too. You have to figure out what he's done exactly to so offend his fellow Jews and get them to think that he has so threatened the community. This is not like something you just you know, well, you know, you're you're proposing some interesting teaching here of the Torah. Um, I disagree with it. So, you know, to the to the lashes with you. That's not the way this works. This is something that that someone is seen as actively threatening the Jewish community in some way. I think you have to 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 account for for where he's getting there. So, I I don't think Paul is actually arguing against Judaism, at least in his own mind. But I do think that his that fellow Jews of his period. Are looking at him and going, what you are doing is a major threat to our to our people and to our community. So we have to grapple with both sides of that. Now, where I come in on this is is sort of a longer journey, and I'm going to try to keep that keep this this part especially short. But 
basically what where where all everything started for me uh, on this was in a 2003 class on the prophets, and I was reading very closely. I was reading Jeremiah in particular for a term paper. And the thing that struck me, and there were, there were a couple places in in some of, some of the secondary literature that stood out on this as well, where people were observing this. The thing that struck me was that Jeremiah promised the restoration and the, and the reconciliation of the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And you see this language a lot in Jeremiah. You see it also in Ezekiel and other places. And I knew, you know, I knew my, my Bible well enough to say house of Israel is usually language for the Northern kingdom of Israel, especially when it's parallel with Judah. Well, that's strange because the house of Israel has been, you know, done away with. They were done away with a century, almost a century and a half before Jeremiah is making this, this prophecy. It's a very strange thing to say. Now, what's actually in the mind of the prophet at that point? I don't know. But then I, it occurred to me that this also, this very prophecy is the longest passage that is quoted in the New Testament, verbatim. It's quoted in, in the epistle to the Hebrews in full. Interestingly, as though Gentiles are incorporated in it. But the promise is not to Gentiles. Right there's it doesn't say I will make a new covenant with Israel and some Gentiles. It doesn't say that. And Paul himself call, calls himself when he says, you know, how should you think of us? You should think of us as ministers or servants of a new covenant. And then he consistently alludes to Jeremiah's promise as what he thinks is happening in his ministry. So this got me started in 2003, and you know the the book that just got published this last year is sort of the completion of that big project to try to figure out and pull out what's he doing, what are they doing here, and essentially what I what what I ended up concluding is when I started going through early Jewish literature, so Jewish literature in the Second Temple period in particular, but also late biblical literature, I found that there's a surprising thing when I read the word Israel. It didn't always mean the same thing as the Jews. That that was surprising because you read like the Talmud, and you know, generally speaking, they're in, in the Mishnah. They're, they're generally speaking, you know, they're they're talking about Israel, Israelites, with some exceptions. There's you know, question about like why does it call Mordecai a Jew? You know, he's from he's from Benjamin, and then there's this whole discussion, right? Which tells you, by the way, that that is something that's they're aware of that late, right? This is something that continues within the tradition. But what I found is that those words are not used synonymously, and I found that there was a whole host of biblical scholarship trying to explain that fact, that they are not coextensive. You would expect two synonymous words to be used, you know, kind of evenly distributed through the literature. But what you'll find is that, like in Josephus, he uses the words Jew and Israelite in different parts of his, of his works. He uses the term Israelite. Interestingly, in the period of his antiquities that focuses on where the northern kingdom is, where you have the monarchy, and where the northern kingdom is active, and up until basically the, the, the Babylonian exile, he kind of is, uses that term. After the return from the Babylonian exile, that term never shows up in Josephus again, which is striking. And after that, all of a sudden, the word Jew shows up throughout, and that barely, that only shows up 22 times prior to the exile. So he shifts terms. So I started pulling pulling on that thread. What's going on here? Because Paul shifts as well in Romans. He's he's taught he he says he, he uses language and refers to his contemporaries as Jews frequently through his letters, but only uses the word Israel six times, except in the chapters Romans 9 to 11, where all of a sudden he talks about Israel and uses that term either 13 or 14 times, depending on a textual variant. So in three chapters, he uses the term Israel or Israelite twice as many times as he does in the rest of his letters combined. Something's going on there. So what, what I ended up doing is really deep, doing a deep dive on what's going on in early Judaism in how these concepts, not just the terms, but the concepts, the ideas that are in play are understood. And what I found is that there remained a consistent expectation of exactly what Jeremiah and a lot of the prophets are, 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 are saying, that you're going to get a full restoration of Israel at some point in the future. And this remains a, you know, a, a present hope for lots of, uh, of theologically uh, uh, 
I don't even know a good term for that. Lot of, lots of theologically attuned traditional Jews. There remains a hope. I mean, you, you, the, uh, the, the, the traditional Amidah blessing, or, uh, prayers are full of that hope. It's in almost every one of them. You know, this is, it's in the traditional Passover Seder. You know, there's a reason that the, that the chair for Elijah is left open, right? So this hope is still there. But the interesting thing is throughout this literature, it's not just an expectation of the, the regathering together and the ascendancy and the blessing of Jews, but of all 12 tribes of Israel. That shows up over and over again, you're right? Blessed are you, Lord, who regathers the 12 tribes, right? This is, this is a current thing. But then when we start going back, when was the last time anybody heard from somebody from Reuben, from the tribe of Reuben? <laughs> Did I hear they're in France? <laughs> yeah, or, you know, Naphtali, or, you know, when, 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 when do we hear from some of these folks? And, you know, you've got a fun anecdote on this as well that I've, I've, I've heard, uh, going back to, you know, your, your own training. Uh, but, um, but, this whole this whole question of what's going to happen with those folks, and if the if the if the expectation is all twelve tribes of Israel will be restored, well, you see that in Jesus' ministry as well. He assigns twelve apostles and says, "You twelve will sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel." Well, the thing is, in Jesus' day, there aren't twelve tribes of Israel. That's a pretty big promise, then, isn't it? Now, the real question is, when Jesus gets crucified, and then you know, there's claims that he's resurrected. Well, where is this restoration that's supposed to happen? Right? That's the real problem. This is the problem in the book of Acts. Will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? And like, is now the time, now that you've resurrected? And the whole book of Acts is a, you know, sort of an, an apology to show why, yeah, that's happening, but it's happening in a way that's not expected. So my argument then is that Paul reads these things in a very specific way. He reads Hosea. He reads these prophets. Hosea says to the northern kingdom, you are not my people. That doesn't apply to Jews. He doesn't say that to Judah, but he does say it to the, to the northern tribes. And he says, what's that? Okay, so I'll, I'll wrap up. Sorry, it's easy to go up and go on. Um, basically, my argument is that what Paul does is he says, all of Israel has to be restored, but a portion of Israel assimilated among the nations. So now Israel has to be resurrected from the nations. At least part of Israel has to be resurrected from the nations. And you have to have Jews and Gentiles together in order to have all Israel present. And so in that sense, they're Israelites, the ones who are coming in, but they're not necessarily Jews. But they are Israelites, sort of, right? And they're resurrected Israelites, Sort of. And so that's where we're really close, but it's a, it's, there's a little bit of a difference on that. So that's where I, 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 I find myself. So I will yield back the floor. It's an honor to be here and to share with you just a quick uh, biographical sketch for me and sort of how I ended up here and in this, this field of study. So I grew up, maybe I think unlike both of you, I grew up in an atheistic environment and my parents were hippies no rules, uh, pretty free household, good time. My dad was a jazz musician. Um, and I didn't really think about God at all growing up. It wasn't a subject in my house. And um, toward the end of my high school, I moved from atheist to agnostic. And then uh, toward the end of high school, my best friend, still my best friend to this day, I uh, started having some problems, and he sh shares with me late night after playing tennis that he had a relationship with God through faith in Christ. And I thought, what are you talking about? <laughs> and uh, he said, you know, God was real. And um, as he talked about it, I thought, I think this guy's right. And so, uh, but I'd never prayed in my life. So the first prayer of my life was a prayer for, for faith. Uh, which I look back on and think, well, that was a pretty good start. Uh, so um, it was a prayer for faith. So I, I uh, ended up studying history. I went to a Christian college kind of last minute. I met my wife in seminary. So there were no cookies involved, but it was, uh, it was in an archaeology lecture. And my first um, class of graduate study was Hebrew. And I'll never forget 
my professor was a Harvard PhD, and he introduced us the Hebrew language by teaching us the name uh, of Micah, Mikayah, who is like the Lord. And uh, that the name is a question. And he said that the answer to that question is that there is none like the Lord. And I was just weeping. And I thought, I'm in the right place. And that was my introduction to Hebrew. And I grew to love the study of the scriptures. I uh, started, uh, you would never have guessed this about me in high school, that I would end up becoming a pastor. So I was pastoring in New England, teaching biblical studies. And I just, once you start learning the scriptures, it's like a healthy addiction. And so um, I just wanted more and more of that. And I remember thinking, boy, I just would love to know more about this. I didn't even have a very, very specific vocational trajectory. And I'd heard great things about Hebrew Union. And so my wife and I, uh, applied and matriculated. I think we were the first couple to matriculate into the PhD program and uh, came here to study. And so big movement from a you know atheist, agnostic, Christian, pastor, biblical studies, and then uh, wanting to study more. And coming here, uh, I had just a, I just want to say publicly here in the library, like our years at Hebrew Union College just are one of the greatest gifts of life. And what we learned here, what we studied here, and to be able to access this material in its original voice is something that I use on a daily basis. So I'm very grateful for Hebrew Union. Uh, Dr. Saracen was one of my doctoral advisors. And I think for me, Meeting Paul, I met Paul in some ways how Jason described him, kind of a, a Protestant reading. And then as I started learning and reading the sources, uh, I found this, this man is a deeply Jewish thinker and uh, came to see that, understand that. And so uh, I ended up in some unusual places. I I ended up here when I was a student at Hebrew Union, I was the Hebrew TA for the rabbinic students. So that was kind of odd and yet <laughs> wonderful that here's the Christian pastor in the graduate school and I'm teaching Hebrew to the rabbis in training. And yet, um, well, it was profound, the friendships that developed in there and some of the questions that we had space and freedom to ask each other. And, um, one of the students, David, same name as me, at one point, he, he was struggling with Hebrew, and I was meeting with him one-on-one, -on -one, and we were talking about it and reading these texts together. And then he just stunned me. He looked at me and said, David, he said, it's like, I've got the Torah up here, but you've got the Torah right here. And, um, you yeah, know, we, we, we wept. And... Uh, I'll never forget that conversation. And he didn't quote Jeremiah 31, but that's the imagery of Jeremiah 31. And I feel really grateful to be, you know, incorporated into uh, a culture of learning, into a, a culture where the scripture, when Paul's asked directly, which he was asked many times, what are you, what are you teaching? It seems on the one hand that you're um, deprioritizing Jews and Judaism. Some of his kinsmen had that impression of him. And he said, that's not, that's not actually what I'm saying. And when he was pressed and was asked, well, what, what's the advantage of the Jew? The first thing he says is being entrusted with the oracles of God. And that's a very devout Jewish thought to have. Like, what's really distinct? Like, we've got these texts. And we were entrusted with them. And so um, I have ended up now, um, I teach, I'm a pastor here in Cincinnati. I teach, I lead a congregation that has 23 native languages spoken in it, about 700 people. You're all invited there tonight. Um, and it's a, it's a real, it's a real gift to serve a congregation. When I was installed as the pastor, 
one of the things you get to do is you 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 get guest speakers that are going to come and speak about why you should be leading this congregation. And one of the people who came and spoke was Dr. Gringis. And he just gave such a beautiful charge uh, uh, for the for the role of a pastor scholar. And so I teach now, uh, I teach New Testament, but I also am the only man on the faculty at Gordon Conwell who teaches rabbinics. So I keep in touch with Dr. Saracen and and I love to introduce Christian readers to rabbinic literature because it's more wonderful than they than they can imagine. And there, there are great things in them to discover. And at one point, students often end up finding out, like, this sounds a lot like <laughs> And so uh, I want, I thought about, uh, like, what, how can I frame Paul in, in this setting, in this, uh, this context? Are you able to advance my slides for me, or do I need to do it? Uh -huh. So let's see if we can go ahead. Go ahead. So um, famous line in the Mishnah. Yetiid Hashabad Shatayim Shahin Arba Vifnim Vishatayim Shahim Arba Bahut. So there are there are two, this is a great, great text to introduce the longest tractate in the Mishnah. That there are there are two goings out of the Sabbath, which are really four uh, for him that's inside the house, and two which are really four for the person outside of the house. And um I thought about this text and great affection for this text. And I remember reading through the Mishnah in Hebrew with Dr. Saracen and a number of other rabbinic students. And, and I remember, and I always remember the first thing he said to us, he said, does this text assume a tremendous amount of cultural knowledge? And we're like, yes, <laughs> yes, it does. And he said, is this an insider text or an outsider text? And he said, you can read through the Mishnah in Hebrew, word for word, translate it perfectly, and have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> um, so uh, I thought about this passage, if we go to this, the next, um, next slide, about Paul, and maybe an invitation to see him from a, a Christian perspective, a little bit to the maybe the stereotype of what Jason was highlighting in the history of interpretation. Sometimes people see Paul as non-Jewish. And in reality, he sees himself as profoundly Jewish. But how do we see his Jewishness actually reflected in his writings? Um, from inside the house, he thinks in deeply Jewish ways. He thinks in deeply Jewish ways about theology. He says it overtly in his letters, God is one. He, he quotes or alludes to the Shema multiple times. And he believes in the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He believes that Israel has a unique election. There is a chosenness that God, in his mysterious providence, appears to, to Abraham, calls him in the midst of his idolatry. And he sees in Abraham a unique mission right from the very beginning. Leave everything you've known. Go to the land I will show you. Isn't that a terrifying interval? <laughs> I'd leave everything you've known, and then I'll tell you more in a little while. Um, and yet, in in the in the Genesis narrative, that that lech lecha in chapter twelve reappears in chapter twenty two, and there's this profound connection between those two scenes. So, and and yet in Genesis twelve, go leave, and I will bless you. But then in you, all the families of the earth. Kol Hamishbarahas will be will be blessed or will bless themselves. That there's a consequence to that, and I think Paul deeply believed that. Um, he believed in eschatology. That's kind of a fun, fancy word, but he he believed that that history was going somewhere. That there was a second great act of redemption that was built on the template of the Exodus redemption. And that there was more to come. He's not making that up. He's reading that in, in the prophets. Uh, the Exodus is referred to 160 times in the Hebrew scriptures. So it's the dominant idea. And that's going to happen again or something like that. He's inside the house in that I think he still teaches and would describe himself as a devout Torah scholar. That was his training under Gamliel. He he quotes from the Hebrew scriptures 85 times explicitly. 
in 13 letters. And then there are many, many more verbal allusions. But those are just the explicit quotations. So he's writing and thinking, like Jacob Newsom says, out of scripture and scriptural categories. He handles the scripture in a way that's very similar to Hillel's hermeneutical rules, the Midot. Um, you know, I love to introduce Christian students, and I've even got my congregation at Kenwood to recognize a Kalbom. I really feel like we've really made progress, and they they see it, and Paul's writings are filled with it. And that's how he was taught to read the scripture. Uh, he also, though, and this may be surprising to some Jewish readers of Paul, that Paul really has halakhic outcomes that he hopes for in his letters. He is concerned for an ethical embodiment. And he, if you press him, he actually thinks that, that his congregations are walking in the ways of Torah and actually fulfilling it. That's what he says. And certain people, and he'll say really kind of uh, par paradoxical sentences like circumcision doesn't matter. It's just what, it's about just keeping the commandments. And you're like, wait, what? how does that sentence work? <laughs> that's what he says. Uh, love is the fulfillment of the law is what he'll end up saying. And he's not the only Jewish thinker to think that. So uh, I'll end with uh, a view outside the house, uh, or I guess the second part real quick, if you go to the next one. How does Paul seem outside the house? He seems outside the house because he comes to believe that Jesus of Nazareth is Israel's promised Messiah. And I think as Christian Jewish scholars together, this is just Paul's own, that's what he thinks. And so um, we can disagree with him on that. We can agree with him, but that's what he thinks. Mm -hmm. And his uh, thinking reflects that. And so uh, in light of that, number two, uh, and, and that differentiates him from, from some Jews um, of, his, of his day. Uh, Celsus is the Roman writer. It gives us our first like knowledgeable critique of Christianity. And at one section, Celsus goes ahead and bashes Jews and Judaism at first and then bashes Christians. And he says, look, Jews and Christians both share the rather nonsensical notion that a redeemer is going to come from heaven and save the world. The only thing that's different about Jews and Christians is Christians think he's coming. And that's a Roman aristocrat. And that's that's how he describes it. Um, secondly, for some of Paul's kinsmen, and even today through the history of interpretation, I think this is critical for understanding, and this connects with Jason's work too, that Paul, I think, understands the restoration of Israel to include this regathering of the scattered tribes, but that it also carries with it the ingathering of all nations to worship the God of Abraham. And, you know, there are hints of this, you know, in the scriptures you know, Isaiah 2, Micah 4, that the nations of the world are going to stream to Zion and say, teach us the Torah. And, and I think, and even the ending of the synagogue liturgy with the prayer that the nations would abandon their idolatry and that, that God would be one and his name the only one. So I thought in the end, like, what if you've never read Paul? Well, where would you go to start with? So I teach Paul's writings, teach them in Greek, uh, I'd really love to do that. Um, and I thought, well, the obvious place to introduce Paul's own voice would be how he introduced himself to people who had never met him. So how did he do that? And uh, if we just go to the last slide, this is how Paul starts his letter to the Romans, which it's his longest letter. Uh, in many ways, it's his most famous. It's his most studied. There are 825 full-length commentaries on this letter. So it's a it's a massive amount of scholarship that no one can completely command. But this was a congregation that he had not started, he had not visited, and they wanted to know who he was. And so he's writing to a mixed group of ethnic Jews, of converts to Judaism, um, or converts to Christianity. And this is how he introduced himself. He says, uh, I'm Paul. And remember, ancient letters start with identifying yourself as the sender, because there's no envelopes in the ancient world. Uh, so he's, who is this guy? He's a servant uh, of Christ Jesus, called an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. So that language of set apart sounds a lot like Jeremiah's call. So he sees himself in that tradition, not apart from it. And 
he's someone who set apart for the gospel. He defines the gospel first and foremost as something that God promised beforehand through the prophets. So the gospel isn't something new. It's the fulfillment of what God had said he would do. It's about his son who's descended from David in his human ancestry. So he's linking the identity of Jesus with the Davidic line. And then was declared son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. So he, he believes that has happened. And the Roman world, this is some subject for another day, the Roman world had a son of God figure and uh, the apotheosis of the Roman emperors. So there's a certain engagement with that view here to say this is the real uh, son of God. It's not Titus or any other deified emperors. He's son of God in power. And who is that? It's Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I think the first person plural is really significant. And it, I love, I'm a big, I'm a pastor. So I'm a big fan of the first person plural. <laughs> uh, and I notice a big difference when people say, I really like your church. Oh, that's not really my church. But there's something really profound that happens when people say, I love our church. And when you use the first person plural, you've drawn a circle that includes the other. And Paul is a ubiquitous first person plural uh, user. And I think that's uh, critical to his identity. And then at the end, he says, through Christ, what do we get? We receive two things. We receive grace, which is the forgiveness. Uh, the, the, uh, tra this translates hesed um, in the Septuagint. And we receive God's loving kindness, his mercy. But we also receive apostleship, which is a mission to the rest of the world. Something like uh, in Judaism, tikkun olam is like chosenness is for a consequence to the rest of the world. And he sees himself as obligated to the rest of the world. Um, and that's how he introduces himself. And I think, who is this guy? I think he's a profoundly Jewish thinker. He's operating in Jewish categories. He's reasoning from the Jewish scriptures. But he's doing that in a way that he's come to see that Israel's Messiah has come in Jesus. And that has consequence for the whole world. And so it's my privilege to be here with both uh, of these uh, gifted scholars and uh, to be back here at the place that I love and have learned so much. So thank you. Thank you, Kenny. We're not done yet, but we are also way over time, way, way more time has been devoted. To it. So what we're going to do is if anybody needs to leave for class, Chris Beecher, who really organized this entire event, if one of those people had to, had to go to class or if you have other obligations, feel free to go. Uh, the cameras will be rolling so you can get the recording of the uh, Q&A that we're going to do now. And we're going to start that now. And if do you want to like kind of sure you, you can call on people. And I've also got yeah. several good questions on our Zoom attendees. So you can do you want to, you know, let's start, start off with, with one of those. Lists. And then yeah. can, all right. Um, so this question is actually probably for our first two panelists. They want to know about the relationship between indulgences and sacrifices. <laughs> that's you. Oh, <laughs> well, you, because you rolled your eyes a little bit, or I don't know that I did. on the head of the yeah, well, or surprise. Well, the, I, so I, I don't think there actually is a very good uh, uh, connection between them. So I, I think Luther understands, uh, Luther is, again, reading the, uh, reading Paul's letters through a lens in which Paul's opponents are essentially Catholics who are buying indulgences and these sorts of things. Uh, and it's a consistent Christian misunderstanding or misrepresentation of the entire uh, sacrificial system with the system of sacrifices and offerings that you see in the Torah as you know, primarily about uh, uh, essentially trying to gain forgiveness by, by making some sort of offering. Uh, which I, I don't think that's what that is at all. Uh, you know, I think uh, more Christians would do well to read Milgram, uh, if, if nothing else. But um, but yeah, I don't think that 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 is actually something that should be connected. I don't think that the notion of indulgences or, or penance in any sort of way like that really makes sense for the sacrificial system. But I do think that historically speaking, when you look at uh, at how some of those things were interpreted. Uh, those things have been sort of put together, and you get this uh, this uh, fairly consistent uh, Christian 
apologetic that basically boils down to, well, you know, sacrifice, uh, you know, sacrifice is just one of those things that, you know, it doesn't really work to take away sins the way that Jesus does. Now, some of that, there is an aspect in like Hebrews where it talks about sacrifice and offering do not actually atone, uh, there, that there's sin that sacrifice and offering don't take take away. Uh, and it is interacting with the with the sacrificial system, but I think in a much more sophisticated, and actually I think the author of Hebrews understands the sacrificial system better uh, in that sense. He's not uh, arguing for something akin to indulgences there. For him, the, the, the question has to do with whether or not uh, sacrifice actually uh, can there within the Torah, there's there there are there are sins for which there is not expiation aside from from death or you know uh, uh, you know analogous you know you've got exile is also held up as a as a uh, a sort of death as well uh, and Hebrews is interacting with that Torah concept when he's when, when the author of Hebrews is uh, is doing that but yeah that's I, I think I think that that's probably enough there. Are there questions from the Audience. I wanted to um actually we got one in the back here first and then it's Galatians a letter from Paul from among the scholars. And if it is, then doesn't Paul write in the third chapter of Galatians, doesn't he sound very anti-legalistic when he says that the Jews are under those who keep the Torah are under a curse and you can never really wiggle out of that because nobody's perfect. And so it's very much, it seems to me, a very anti-legalistic argument that he's making over there. And a professor, didn't you say earlier that, in your opinion, Paul was not taking such a position? But it yeah. seems like in Galatians, he does. Am I wrong? I just taught Galatians 3 this week. So yeah. let me see. Uh, give, give, uh, give, give it a shot. I think all of us should talk about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you said it seems. And that's, that's the word I kind of would build mm -hmm. on. I think the real topic in Galatians 3 is who are the descendants of Abraham and how do we recognize them? And the, the movement of Galatians 3 is really around uh, who are the people among whom God dwells? Where is the spirit? And so that's how Galatians 3 starts and it ends with if you are Christ, if you have been baptized into Christ, you are Christ, you are descendants of Abraham, you are heirs according to the promise. So if that's how it starts, that's how it ends. I think the language of being under being accursed is not, I don't think we should take that as, well, you tried hard and you didn't succeed, so you're accursed. I think I think that's language that Paul is drawing on from the tradition itself, that understanding the exile as as being driven out of the land through disobedience, which is, you know, the narrative of Kings. That's the perspective of Ezekiel. So how did we get here and why? And then what is the resolution of that? The resolution in Ezekiel is the return of God's presence, which Paul, I think, sees with the spirit. And how did that, how does that happen? So that's my short answer. I suppose I would say that I, I think Paul is what we might call a proto-dispensationalist in the sense that the Torah was God's initial way, his initial dispensation for dealing with the Jewish people. And in that respect, it was good and right and noble, and it ought to have been observed piously, but that since the resurrection, there is a new dispensation. God interacts with Jews and the world in a different way. And in some ways, that's very similar to Islam, saying that, yeah, the Torah was a revelation, but it was an incomplete and now surpassed revelation. And then adding in, yeah, Jews messed it up also by changing words or whatnot. But, um, and so I think what he's suggesting in Galatians 3 is that on the one hand, the Galatians need to understand that if they become circumcised and take on the burden of that first uh, dispensation, then they are living in the wrong era. They're, they're, they're understanding their relationship with God in a, a way that is uh, uh, gone, that is over. Um, but that doesn't mean that Paul is opposed to the observance of certain laws that are in the Torah, 
Um, certainly, if those are laws that are good laws and laws that cohere with what a person would do if they are living uh, in the spirit as well. So I, sometimes I think it's too harsh to say, you know, Paul is against the law or against legalism. I think it's just a different understanding of, of an end of times dispensation, which is dramatically changed the way a person, Jew or not Jew, ought to understand the law and interact with the law, but it's not just a wholesale rejection. Yeah, so I will wholeheartedly agree with both of the prior statements uh, and just very quickly add a couple more things. One is, if you look at the back wall there, it has the famous quote from Hillel, uh, the rest is commentary, go and learn. I think Paul completely agrees with that. Uh, and if you look at what he says, he says, uh, love fulfills the law, right? Uh, love your neighbor as yourself fulfills the, the whole Torah. That's what he says in Galatians, at the end of Galatians. He's, you know, love fulfills the, the Torah. This does, this does the whole thing, which, by the way, suggests that he thinks the Torah needs to be fulfilled. But the issue for him is how, in this new dispensation, in this new era, he thinks that the, that, an age to come. He thinks there's an additional age to come, but he thinks a new age has begun with the resurrection of Jesus. And the new age then involves the Torah being written on the heart by receiving the spirit such that then people, I think when he understands having received the spirit, he thinks that receiving the spirit has solved the love God problem, which he sees as endemic through the, through, through the biblical witness. Israel, you know, if you read Deuteronomy, you know, God himself says, you know, uh, or Mo, well, Moses says to this day, Adonai has not given you a heart to know or eyes to see or ears to hear or so on. And you have this refrain and, you know, at the end of, of Deuteronomy, uh, you know, so I, you know, put this in the book of the law, in the book of the Torah, so that, you know, this will be a witness against them. And Jubilees picks this up, you know, in the second temple period where, you know, it, it does the same thing. Uh, and you have this notion that the Torah itself serves as a witness against disobedient Israel such that Israel falls under the curses of the covenant. And what Paul's arguing is, look, if you receive the spirit, then you no longer are under the curse because the curse only applies up until the new age comes. And now you receive the, the, the spirit in the new age. And now you have the love of God in your hearts that the, that the Torah itself promises. And now all that's left is go and learn and love your neighbor. So you're going to fulfill the law the way that the law should be fulfilled. And this is how this is supposed to be done in this new messianic era for him. Uh, and, and then he says, but if you're going to you know, try to do this and go back and be circumcised and bring yourself under the written material that is for the prior age, then you're essentially revisiting that prior dispensation. And now you're just standing under the, under the very curses for which the Messiah was supposed to come to redeem Israel. So now you you know you you're you're stuck. You're misunderstanding the 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 age in which you live. I think that's the the fundamental thing. But he is not opposed to Torah, to obedience to Torah in any way in that sense. He just sees it as something that is a contingency until Israel receives the heart to be fully obedient in this new era. And I think that's that's his point of emphasis. Other questions from <laughs> Do I get that one before and then off? Okay. To follow up on that, do you think that the destruction of the temple is anywhere in the mindset of Paul as he's talking about uh, the aspect of, of living in Torah and communicating or connecting with God? Well, he dies before <laughs> the uh, temple is destroyed. Of course. Right? Uh, but <laughs> so, is there writing on the wall? Well, I think. I, th I guess I guess what I would point to is, you know, he he's not the only first century Jew who's concerned about how the temple is actually functioning. And so you have other renewal movements within Judaism at Quran and others who are who are, who are saying we're not sure that what's going on there is 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 one hundred percent kosher. So, he, I think though that he does say in, in Ephesians 2 and, and 3 that he sees the congregation, uh, this combination of ethnic Jews and converted uh, Gentiles, 
and describes them as a living sanctuary, as a building made with living stones, which I think really is a reflection on Ezekiel 1, where you see the throne of God is like alive. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a piece of furniture that's living. And that, again, that goes back to the spirit uh, in, in my reading of Paul, that the spirit isn't just the subjective presence of God in my life, but that the spirit is the, the Shekinah, the indwelling of God dwelling in the midst of his people. And he's even in Corinthians, when he says that a, a non-believer, a pagan walks into the congregation gathering and senses God is here and said, and the thoughts of their heart are made known and then says, you know, God dwells among you. So I think he, I think he's engaging in that. And of course you have the synoptic uh, words, uh, recorded of Jesus that the that the sanctuary will be will come down. So I'll let I'll let you guys speak to that. Uh, well, Paul does talk about the temple and actually to bolster what I said earlier, quite famously in First Corinthians, talks about Jews at the temple and says, consider Israel according to the flesh, which is an interesting way to distinguish Israel suggesting that there is some other kind of Israel corresponding to what I said before, that Paul can say, well, there's Israel, and then there's Israel, and sometimes just leaves it blank, but there, I think, gives us quite an obvious clue that there are different meanings for Israel. Um, but I would also remind us that in the 20 or so years that I think are represented in Paul's epistles, he spends, of those 20 years at most, a month in Jerusalem. All of the rest of the time is spent in Damascus, Antioch, Ephesus, Corinth, Athens, and so on and so forth, where I think that he's interacting with diasporic Jewish communities that themselves don't really think that much about the temple, except that it is kind of the home base that they know they're supposed to care about and give money to, but it's not an integral part of their social or cultural or religious life. Um, I think Paul is actually one of the best witnesses to that phenomenon in the diaspora. But he does also plan his travel accord to to be present at these uh, in, in acts. So he's yeah, but that I, uh, well, we don't want to talk. <laughs> you don't want me to talk about the historicity yeah, of acts. I just mean the uh, way it's yeah. presented. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and, and even at that, it's only once. <laughs> that he's that he's doing that so as a teacher of mine once said axe has an axe to grind yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think they i think that's been adequately more than adequately answered on that all, all i'll say is that uh in uh second second er, in first uh first thessalonians there's a passage where he suggests that uh that those who killed jesus and the prophets uh are basically have come under the wrath of god and this has actually been uh, uh you know sort of a clobber passage used against jews historically uh, it's, if there were one comma that I could remove from the majority of uh, English translations of the Bible, it would be in that in, in that uh, section of verses where he says, uh, uh, you became imitators of, uh, of the churches of God that are in Judea, uh, for you have also endured suffering at the hands of your countrymen like they did from the Jews. And then there's usually a comma, the Jews, comma, who killed Jesus and the prophets, et cetera, et cetera. Which sounds like it's like Jews, a positive, those people who killed, but that comma is not there in Greek. It's a relative, it's a relativizing thing. It's specifically the Jews who killed Jesus. And he says, you know, wrath has now come upon them. And in that sense, I think he, like other, like many other first century Jews, expected that the Jewish temple was going to be destroyed imminently. Now, I do think that that's the case. I think there's evidence that in early, early Christianity that that was an expectation. Uh, Jesus seems to have prophesied against it uh, in very Jeremianic fashion. So, you know, this is not out of the question for there to be a sort of Jewish prophetic strain that has strong feelings about the mishandling of things in Jerusalem and at the temple. And I think Paul was among the folks that had his misconception or his uh, his um, misgivings about that. So, uh, but I, I don't think that that it plays that much in, partly because it's just much later. Rid of that comma, folks. One or two more questions. Did you have a question earlier? Yes, do you have a question earlier? Yeah. Anybody else in the audience? 
Oh, Ryan. No, Ryan. Ryan. Yeah, yeah, of course. Go ahead, Ryan. It's all you. Oh, you are. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sabin, question for you. Seems like the fall within Judaism scholars put great emphasis on the idea that the nations will come back with Israel to worship alongside the God of Israel. In your reading, if Gentiles become Israel, is there still room in Paul's mind for this eschatological vision of genuine Gentile coming alongside Israel? Yeah, I think, so this is something I've been playing with more recently uh, as I've kind of been reflecting on some of some of this. Uh, so, noting, first of all, I think it's important to note that Paul does not say the Gentiles are, you know, are coming into, into Christ or whatever. It's these are Gentiles. These are some Gentiles that are that, that are coming in, and they are being grafted into yeah. the olive tree in Rome, in Romans eleven. They're coming into Christ. They're heirs of Abraham, and of, of course, who who is the heir of Abraham except for Israel, right? So they're becoming incorporated into Israel. But then there's also other possibilities of okay, what happens among those who don't become incorporated in that way mm -hmm. but then you know sort of at, at, perhaps at the at the at the second coming at a variety of different points you've got the possibility of these other nations that come in in another fashion that they worship in that way i think that he does leave room for a sort of righteous gentile category of those who are not actually in the tree but then are impacted by and you know this later category i think that i think that's viable in paul i don't know that uh, we see a whole lot of it because he's very much more concerned about those who are coming in and present and arguing for their full status. And I, I think that's a, a possibility for him. Uh, and and I, I think uh, the the degree to which people have certainty about who Paul thinks is in and out in the long haul, I think is, uh, I think we need to have maybe a little bit less than that, or at least I have a little bit less certainty these days than I used to. Um, one of our questions online, we want to know, uh, what would Paul say about modern non-Jews, Christians, or other Gentiles uh, practicing like the Jewish ritual laws, like kosher dietary laws, things like that, as a means of getting close to God, or what would be the role of the other <laughs> uh, you, you take that one first. I, I mean, uh, <laughs> I feel like that's a question for a pastor. To, to, I mean, to try, no, I mean, to try to make the 2000 year old texts of Christianity speak to contemporary issues is a, a homiletical religious exercise less than a historical right. exercise. I, I mean, I would say, I, I suspect that the first thing Paul would say if he arrived in a DeLorean in the HUC parking lot um, would be, I'm, I'm shocked to see that the world still exists because <laughs> I'm yeah. quite certain he thought that Jesus would be returning in, in the nigh. And so, um, and given that disappointment, I think it's kind of hard. Uh, I will uh, let me say one more thing. Uh, I think he was an in, an incredibly smart, careful reader, um, and his initial reaction might have been, "Oh my goodness, Jesus hasn't come back yet." Mm -hmm. I'd say give him five years, and I suspect he would work out a very elaborate plan for exactly why what's happened has happened, what's about to happen. And I don't know how he'd weigh in on whether Christians should start, you know, uh, avoiding skyline chili. Um, I don't know where he'd come down, but I suspect he'd have a well thought out opinion. <laughs> you think it would take five years? I'm giving him less than a month. You know, I think um, it's an interesting phenomenon too. I think I would want to just reframe that slightly to say, you know, the the church historically lost its ability to read Hebrew. You know, you have just a handful of early church writers who know Hebrew. And that knowledge is really reacquired by the church through Jewish teachers in the medieval period. And so I would say our communities get get stronger, healthier, and better when there is that uh, intellectual exchange. Uh, I, I mean, I learned to read Rashi's commentary here as a student, and I had not known of him before, and I found here's this whole world of careful readers asking questions that I never would have thought to, to ask. Uh, 
I think that there's there are tremendous resources for understanding the scripture in that history of interpretation. There are real insights to be gained by Jewish and Christian scholars looking at the text together uh, and being honest about what they see that's different or has different consequence for their community. I think sometimes we live in a time where people are starved for transcendence. You know, we, we live in an aggressively imminent age that's um, constantly telling us that everything that's really, really important is going to happen in a 30 second interval. And that's not really true. And, you know, we, we have in our house the 100 year test. We used to tell our kids, you know, are people going to be talking about this in 100 years? And our kids would say, no. And then we say, well, then we're not going to be talking about it. So we want to talk about things that are really lasting. But I, I think sometimes Christians come in to um, Judaism from the outside and they're kind of hungry for, you know, a, a life of faith is meant to be lived in real time. And there are ways in which the Jewish tradition is, has done that remarkably well. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 is a famous passage for Christians and for Jews, but they cite what the line that is the most important differently. And I think it shows the difference in how we're reading the text. Christians cite that, trust the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. And then, then it kind of trails off. Mm -hmm. In all your ways acknowledge him, he will direct your paths. And when Jews read that and quote that, they say, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean on your understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there's a deep, wide, centuries of reflection of like, how do we live this out in a way that keeps us mindful of holiness? So um, I think that, I don't think it's fair for, or necessarily uh, that helpful for, to just sort of parachute into that and pick and choose that. Uh, I will tell you one, another very, very briefly, just profound moment that happened for me as a student. Um, you know, I pastor a Baptist church, um, half of our congregation, about 700 people, don't even know it's a Baptist church, if you ask them, and because the denominational identity is not that important to people uh, increasingly. But one of the features of our church is we eat a lot together, and it's, it's really a it's an important part of, of the community and the shared table. And of course, that's deeply rooted in, I mean, the first commandment of God is like, here's what you can eat and not eat. And so, you know, the, the application of holiness in Leviticus 11 starts with the table. And um, so again, I, I was teaching all of these rabbinical students, uh, Hebrew, and somewhat you know, naively did what I normally would think to do. It just like, it, we just invited everyone to come to our house. And we spent hours and hours uh, cooking this meal for everyone. And, you know, we love to have people at our house and, and everyone was there and no one was eating. <laughs> and it got just like slightly awkward. And I didn't know what, what's wrong? And one of the rabbinical students um, kind of pulled me aside. He pulled me into the other room and he said, you know, I'm so sorry. If these had been served on paper plates, we could have eaten. And it was, it was, it was, uh, it was an intense moment actually, because we had really poured ourselves into the preparation and I didn't know what to do. It's rare for a pastor to be at a loss for words. I didn't know what to do. And this rabbinical student leader, after he told me that, he kind of gathered himself and he walked into my kitchen and he started singing. And he started singing, he named my toga, my mother. And he ate. And you know, I, that was, that was his decision, but I think I think all of us were really uh, impacted by like what what's happening here, and we want to we want to share this meal somehow. And if I had known, I would have done differently. It was a, it was a 
yeah, it was uh, another unforgettable moment. So those are not easy things. And those are the very dynamics that Paul's life in ministry was filled with. It, not coincidentally, there have been people who have said that the crux interpretum of early Christianity is the so-called Antioch incident. What happened in Galatians 2.11 and following when Peter and Paul, Barnabas and whatnot at Antioch had this falling out? Another big question is what happened afterwards, which we're not sure, but the issue there, I think without any shadow of a doubt, is conviviality. So this problem of this early community of Jews and non-Jews, Jews, eating together. Now, whether the issue was kosher foods or simply issues of Jews sharing a table with Gentiles in the first place, conviviality is at the very foundation of Christianity. And here it is fascinating, but 2,000 years later, it's um, still an issue. Well, and even, even to something like circumcision, which is, a, you know, this is something I, I had a small footnote in my book about uh, because, you know, Paul's very, Paul has strong objection to Gentiles, Gentile men getting circumcised in order to become a part of the people. He, he, he has, he, he says, this is, this is the wrong, you're, you're going the wrong way. You're going about this the wrong way. Having begun in the spirit, are you going to complete the work on the flesh? No. But here's the real question. Conviviality. What happens if a Jewish Jesus following woman in that community marries the uncircumcised Gentile man who has the spirit. What are they supposed to do when they have their first boy at eight days old? What are they supposed to do? Are they supposed to circumcise him or not? That's that's a different question than should you be circumcised to come in in the first place. Now I suggested I think Paul would say go ahead and circumcise the boy. I think he would. I think he would suggest that, which he he seems to advocate for in the case of Timothy, right? Because because yeah. saying don't do that don't is overstating his view, right? Because overstating his view is to say, are you really about just jettisoning this heritage? And I think he would say, no, I'm I'm not. I'm yeah, not. I think he would have said, you can circumcise the child as long as you acknowledge. That circumcising the child is not what is bringing him into the covenant. Yeah, it's adiaphora. You're doing it because yeah. it's an old, quote, Kaplan. It's an old folk way. <laughs> we still do that, but that's it's not salvific. It's not significant. So if you have to do it, do it. Yeah. Just know that it doesn't mean anything. And, and I, I 100% agree with that. But I think, but I think he actually would have said, for the sake of conscience, yeah. not for your yeah. conscience, but for other people, circumcise the boy. It's not going to hurt him later. It's and be and in Romans 14, he says, look, you. Whether it's the festival calendar, Shabbat, dietary laws, circumcision, if you want to do that, do it. I think he ends up basically saying, just don't require everyone to hold your view. Yeah. You because know, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of, there's a lot he of does space call the, in it. He does call the observers the weak. Yeah, you know, there's, you there's a little dig there. That's true. That's true. He, <laughs> that's right. Get in the game, I guess. Yeah. Well, it, you can read that a couple of different ways yeah, in terms of so, social location. So. Okay. Um, we had a bunch more questions online. If anybody, would you feel comfortable sharing your email addresses if people want? Sure. To yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. And I if you want to continue the conversation, uh, we'll continue it tonight at seven o'clock at, at Kenwood. So.